new boss, same as the old boss. Uh, <laughs> now, the, the project I just finished describing had to do with what goes on in the PTAB ex post and what goes on in the USPTO examination process ex ante. This is a, uh, rather than a longitudinal study, a parallel litigation study, right? What's going on in the PTAB vis-a-vis -vis what's going on in the district courts? So Sean's presentation has shed uh, a little bit of light on this already, and with Jay Kaysen and, uh, and Artie Rye, I hope to, to shed some more. So, uh, of course, background, motivation, we, we all know why we care about this. Uh, the main story here is that the incentives to challenge patents in the PTAB are uh, linked, perhaps not inextricably, but importantly, to how patents are asserted in the district courts, right? So with certain exceptions, such as the joinder rule, you can't uh, challenge the uh, patent in an IPR proceeding if the person making the challenge or, or its legal privy or real party in interest was sued by the patent owner for infringement more than one year earlier. And this raises at least two interesting questions, probably more. One is whether this, the parties being sued in district court are the same parties uh, who are filing IPR petitions uh, asserted against them. And the answer, it turns out, varies by technology, as is often the case. Uh, and so in this case, what we actually did to test it was look to see whether the last district court defendant prior to the PTAB challenge was, in fact, the petitioner in the first PTAB challenge. Are they the same? If yes, that gives us an interesting answer. If no, that gives us an interesting answer. Um, this isn't the only way to look at it. You could also just look at the first uh, U.S. District Court uh, patent owner and compare that with uh, you know, the defendant there versus the, the petitioner here. Or you could just look at the universe of District Court defendants and see, did any of them file the PTAB challenge that we now observe? These are all related questions, and they all provide part of the answer. This is an initial cut that suggests that First of all, it does vary by technology. Um, in the case of chemical and mechanical inventions, uh, a substantial majority, uh, and others, uh, there, uh, the substantial majority of the first PTAB petitioners were, in fact, the last Article III defendant. Right? That suggests that you are indeed asserting your own interests and protecting your own interests in the PTAB when you are challenging a patent. In the case of software patents and drugs and medical patents, it's less than half. And so the majority of these cases are not being brought by the most recently sued Article III defendant. So we need to go back and look at you know, the other measures. But if this holds true for all of them, it may suggest that somebody getting sued invites somebody else to challenge the patent instead. And that means that the patentee has tipped its hand in litigation, and somebody else is free riding on that information. That may or may not be a, a good thing or a bad thing, but it's an interesting thing to be sure, because it tells us what the strategic choice involved might be. Now, the share of patents within these uh, technology subcategories for which the last Article III defendant was the first PTAB petitioner, these are the top subcategories, right? These are the top level six categories. The uh, National Bureau of Economic Research has this many subcategories. You can drill down pretty sophisticated uh, detail. These are the top subcategories. So computer hardware and software, communications, uh, miscellaneous electrical and chemical, surgery and medical instruments, and so on. So uh, just more detail at that level. And then finally, uh, and this is before I'll turn it over to my, my co-authors, how frequently is the lag between patent assertion and dis in district court and the IPR in the PTAB longer than one year? Right, there is that one-year deadline, but of course there are caveats and limits to it. Uh, you yourself have to be the one sued in order for that limitation to apply. Uh, and even if the one-year clock is not yet ticking, there may be an incentive to petition sooner rather than later. So the next graph will show the share of challenged patents for which the lag from the last district court assertion to the IPR petition was more than one year. So over a 90-day window that moves from left to right, we start at uh, December 15, 2012, three months from, or 90 days from the, the effective date of the PTAB petitions, all the way to, uh, to the end of last calendar year. So you see, it's essentially uh, a cyclical trend. Now, two cycles doesn't make a cyclical trend, I think. But uh, we need to disentangle this further. We need to see, are all of the defendants really being represented uh, in the, the PTAB challenger uh, decision, whether there's free riding going on 
whether there's uh, free riding going on by the 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 PTAB challengers themselves. You know, one sees a challenge, now serial challenges may follow. These are all further questions, and for that, I'll turn it over uh, to, to Jay. So we uh, continue to look at uh, the uh, issue of multiple challenges uh, to the same patent um, and uh, focused on coding as much information as possible for uh, 2014. Uh, so that includes institution decisions and final decisions uh, for IPRs filed in 2013. Uh, but of course, it would not include uh, petitions filed in the last part of 2014, which would be decided in 2015. So um, I know we're kind of running short on time, so let me just show you the data, um, and I'm happy to answer other questions on methodology and so on. So here's the breakdown. The focus here is on the number of patents, not the number of petitions. On the left-hand side, you see that there are 54 patents that were challenged by the same petitioner two or more times, okay? So there's 54 patents that were challenged two or more times. And then it's broken down by same claims, same grounds, same claims, different grounds, different claims, same grounds, different claims, different grounds, okay? So, so, so you can, this is pretty granular, you can count it any which way you want, okay? But, but you can see that there's a sizable number of petitions challenging the same claims, and in fact challenging it on the same grounds. And this is on the left-hand side, these are the 54 multiple two or more patents by the same petitioner. Well, let's go to the other side. The other side is a different petitioner, typically, a different defendant in involving the same patent that was filed um, you know, by typically on the same day by the plaintiff. So there you see there's 75 patents that were challenged by a different defendant. Okay? And again, once again, you see that there's a sizable number, uh, about a third of all of them involve the same claims uh, and uh, same or different grounds. And the different grounds are very often a 102 being made into a 103. So th that's the most common situation. Okay, let's continue on and look a little bit more closely at, uh, um, um, I'm gonna skip some of the uh, analysis and stuff in the interest of time. So let's look here at the number of patents and the number of petitions, okay? So there's more than 100 patents that had two petitions. And there's a sizable number of patents that had three petitions. And in fact, the highest is one patent with 21 petitions uh, filed against it, okay? Uh, so, so, so there is a tremendous amount of multiple petitions filed. Um, and, and so, of course, we can decide, uh, you know, uh, where to draw the line and, and so on and so forth. The different claims, different grounds should be legitimate, but it also, one of the other things we noticed was that if 10 claims are brought in a lawsuit, you often find that there are two or three IPRs, uh, now we, maybe because of page limitations, et cetera, but you sort of have three or four claims being challenged in one IPR, another set of three or four claims being challenged in another IPR, and another set of three or four claims being challenged by a third IPR. Uh, so, 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 so there's a fair amount of interesting behavior going on uh, that uh, we can sort of uh, talk about. Uh, and I'll stop right here, uh, and I'll turn it over to Artie uh, for the case studies. Great, thanks Jay. So as you can tell, our, our data is still being collected and as Jay pointed out, what we have in terms of the quantitative information is under-inclusive because we're just going through uh, petitions that were instituted by December 2014, which is under-inclusive for obvious reasons. That said, we did have an opportunity, um, even with that under-inclusive data, to look at the most petitioned patents and see what was going on there. So I'll give you just some case studies for reasons of time. We won't be able to go through all of them. And I think these case studies illuminate, in part at least, is there a problem or is there not? And what is PTAB doing about it if there is a problem, et cetera? 
So uh, these case studies involve either the same petitioner or different petitioners. The first case study actually involves both. This is the famous or infamous Zond litigation, which uh, <laughs> had the most multiple petitions in our sample. Um, actually, many more than Jay indicated because he didn't go through the, the petitions that were uh, not instituted. So, but this is the case study. So, and in, in, you know, one of the questions we have for you is, is this a, an example of a system working or is this an example of a system not working? So, seven patents were asserted um, against multiple defendants in seven cases, uh, and nine defendants, ten against Gillette, but um, in the main, on average, seven patents asserted in each of these cases. Now, there may have been some strategic behavior on the part of the patent owner. They filed in the District of Massachusetts, but they didn't file them as related cases, so these cases ended up being assigned to five different judges. Intel filed the IPRs first, it got a stay, um, and basically that stay resulted in everyone piling on and saying we're going to file identical petitions, same grounds, same claims, same art, very explicit about it, um, and they all got their cases stayed based upon those petitions. Now it was a fairly quick process, they did it within about two months of Intel getting a stay, so maybe that's the system working. We can, we can uh, talk about that in the Q&A. Um, they didn't, all of, them, all of them didn't file joinder motions though, and then uh, as a consequence perhaps on August 5th, a couple of months later, the PTAB actually ordered all the petitioners to file motions, joinder motions within 10 business days. So as a consequence of that order, there was joinder for all the petitions and all the patents. So, um, Currently, as a consequence, we have 21 pending reviews of nine patents with 56 joint proceedings. Intel ended up settling out, and so the petitioners ended up being joined to the TMC petitions, um, and that's how things are happening right now. Now, query, is this, well, clearly it's active management by the PTAB. They had that conference call, they said, okay, you guys have filed ad identical petitions, you better get your joinder motions in. Is this efficient and fair? These, this is the question we want to ask all of you. Uh, another case study, another heavily positioned patent uh, was patent number 7365871. E-Watch sued 11 firms basically on the same day, although not exactly on the same day, in the Eastern District of Texas. All those cases went to um, one judge. There was another patent involved per some earlier discussion. All these cases involve multiple patents typically. Um, so we had Iron Dome, which you know, one can characterize it in different ways, filing the first petition. And that petition was instituted, but after that was instituted, that really, or that filing did not really cause anyone to, to do much. And then they ended up settling out anyway. So the HTC petition, which was a defendant's petition, was filed and instituted, and that institution, um, caused a stream of IPRs. So in the pre prior case, in the Zond litigation, it was the decision to stay that caused the, uh, the stream of IPRs. In this case, it was the institution. Um, although not the institution on Iron Dome, I guess for whatever reason, people didn't think Iron Dome was the place to, to free ride upon, shall we say. Rather, it was HTC. Um, and this is what's happening in terms of all of the petitions. Now, question, what is the PTAB doing in this case? So the patent owner in this case has utilized 325D. You guys might be aware of 325D. It's the, the part of the AIA that gets to perhaps some of what um, Senator Coons was talking about. Look at if you have the same art and the same arguments, you can't come back over and over and over again. Um, whether you're the same petitioner or a different petitioner. So this, in this case, the patent owner utilized 325B with respect to a different petitioner, Apple, saying that basically Apple's arguments overlapped with the arguments of another petitioner, and they cited a case from the PTAB that some of you may be familiar with, Konopko slash Unilever versus Procter & Gamble, which basically talked about not getting multiple bites at the apple, although in that context it was respect, with respect to the same petitioner. Um, the board didn't seem to think that those, that 325B utilization was relevant when there was a different petitioner, and it denied the petition um, on the merits. It didn't even address uh, the redundancy arguments. Um, it granted another petition um, 
even though similar arguments regarding redundancy were made there, and this is what it said about redundancy in the grant that it made with respect to Apple's arguments. It said, and this is the entirety of the reasoning, eWatch urges that this is um, redundant. Um, basically, we've considered this issue, and we've considered whether these arguments are redundant, and we think they're not, but with no reasoning, just they're not period, full stop, and that's not, therefore, it's not sufficient, the arguments are not sufficient to warrant a discretionary denial. So our preliminary hypothesis is the PTAB is viewing, quote, unquote, redundant arguments by different petitioners quite differently from, quote, unquote, redundant arguments by the same petitioner. So, for example, the cases in which 325D has been used, and we've got a bunch of those, generally involve the same petitioner with a subsequent petition filed later. Not the same day, in the same day it seems that everyone seems to agree that maybe the page limits re require multiple petitions. But if a subsequent petition is filed later and the same claims were previously raised, um, whether granted or denied, 325D is being used quite frequently by the PTAB. So there seems to be a distinction again being drawn between the same petitioner versus different petitioners. In some cases, 325D is even being used for non-cumulative art and arguments. And so Unilever provides an interesting example of that. This was a second petition um, where there were seven new prior art citations brought in. The board nominally used 325D, but it really couldn't because these were new prior art citations. So it ultimately what it said was, we almost are going to apply an estoppel type argument. We can't, the same petitioner can't strategically unveil their best prior art and arguments in serial petitions using our decision on institutions as a roadmap. So at least to the same petitioners, they're being pretty assertive sometimes. And one question we have is, why is this not happening with different petitioners? Is this kind of a due process concern? Everyone, sh no, the same person shouldn't get multiple bites at the apple, but different, different people can. Um, and what does that mean as a policy matter? There was one case involving unified patents in which a different petitioner was barred. For reasons of time, I won't go into the details, um, but basically this was a case in which two petitions had already been instituted. There's currently litigation up at the Federal Circuit on one of the uh, invalidations. Um, now, Sean and I have talked offline about this and uh, you know, query whether the decision to deny unified petitions patent was good or bad as a policy matter because it turns out Rackspace later settled and so maybe it was important for NetApp and UP to come in in that case. We can talk about that. But in general, different petitioners are not barred. That's, I think, a, a, a general statement we can make on, uh, on our review of these multiply petitioned patents. So questions. And this is for our panel as well as the audience. Should the PTAB require later in type petitions to specify how their art and arguments differ from prior petitions? Or at least say that they're explicitly identical for purposes of joinder? They have, I think, rulemaking authority to do this under 316A2 of the current AIA. And if they do this, should the requirements differ for the same petitioner versus different petitioner? And just to be clear, right now, I think a lot of responses are raising the 325D argument, but one could imagine the PTAB affirmatively requiring in a rulemaking that you have to specify ex ante as a multiple petitioner later in time why your art and arguments are different from those of prior petitions on the same patent. So those are my questions for all of us, and now we'll move on to comments and questions from the audience. <laughs> 